Well, first off, I, I must have an all-star lineup because the room is full and it's uh, five o'clock in the afternoon. So credit. I said, I'm going to travel with a rock star all the time because <laughs> the photographer is around. You wake up with the flashes and the rest. Uh, all jokes aside, this is going to be one of the, the best panels of the day because uh, the state of play worldwide, uh, if there's any sector or any uh, grouping of countries that will be affected most by the post-pandemic surge and then the challenge of Russia and Ukraine, it is the emerging markets. And I think that's why we have so many people in the room. We're very eager to see uh, how do you stamp out the inflation? Uh, what's the calibration by the G7 countries with the higher interest rates we're starting to see? The reactions we've seen already in Egypt to respond quickly to the challenge, uh, to reach out to the International Monetary Fund to send the right signal that we have our, our hands on the wheel and it's uh, under control. But our, our game here for the next 38 minutes is to analyze uh, the choppy waters, you know, the clear and present danger, danger if you will, uh, but also look to the medium term of how do we get out of that uh, trough and continue the growth recovery that uh, we're hoping for. Let's be frank, in the last 12 years, we've had everything and the kitchen sink thrown at us. We had a global financial crisis, eight to 10, uh, a recovery led by a very challenging Arab Spring in this region, which uh, created a great deal of strains, and then a global pandemic uh, that hit all global supply chains, which are not healed just yet. Uh, and then who would expect a, a conflict uh, in Eastern and Central Europe and the migration that we see into the European Union? Uh, that's a, a great deal. I couldn't ask for a better panel. I'm going to ask the panelists because of our 40-minute window to keep their answers to two minutes or less so we can cover all uh, the different topics. Uh, I'd like to start with our host, uh, His Excellency Abdullah bin Tuk Amari. And I know you had a very ambitious agenda for 2022, and that is to sign eight uh, trade agreements or SEPA agreements. Uh, we're, we had one with India that's been outlined, so you went with the biggest market. Uh, there's conversations taking place with Israel this week. So is the message today to this audience of uh, you know, very educated uh, bankers and those in governments and those in international organizations is you don't take your eye off the original objective despite the turbulence we see? And then how do you respond economically to the turbulence, the higher grain prices, for example, we're living in a higher energy environment, which I'm sure you don't want to spiral even higher, which puts pressure on your trading partners. What's the message on that front, Your Excellency? I think, well, uh, first of all, um, it's accelerated the, the, the need for, for more SEPAs. Yes, we announced eight, but what's really happening on a turbulence at the moment really makes sure that we want to align together and diversify the economy and bring supply chains more closer to consumers. That's something which is very vital and important. You know, uh, the, 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 the rise of inflation is happening so fast, it has a discussion with the central banks. But with the ministers of economy, we have consumer protection. You know, people are going to come and complain about the rise of, 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 of uh, food, the rise of wheat, the rise of prices and so forth. Mm. Let's not forget the Arab Spring happened because of the rise of bread. The challenges that we'll fight with inflation is huge. So what, means that, what we need is we are more mature at the moment. Mm. We're more agile at the moment and more nimble as well to understand that in, in order to actually look at what's going to happen globally in, the, in, in, in a world where it's very foggy, we need to understand how do we need to navigate such uh, uh, planes and how to actually navigate through that. Now, the point is we, we look at this fog and we understand we're navigating through it. The question is that really plays is are we in, in a lake or are, are we at, at the middle of an ocean? Hmm. That's something which is very important and vital and what to really determine in the next couple of months is how do we navigate through this. Now, when we look at that... I because think, of the turbulence, you're exactly, saying protected. Exactly. So we want to land one day towards a place where we can actually look at more uh, diversity of economy, more policies in the economy that actually looks at a, a, a recovery. You know, this is something which is challenging. But the good thing is... Uh, I, took, I took the Ministry of Economy in, in, in July 2020 in the post-pandemic uh, time. So that gives me you know, nothing to, to, to lose, to, to push all the buttons and to make sure that we have an economy that's very agile, that is very nimble and very active as well with the globe. Good. Um, Dr. Drup, I think it would be interesting to hear from your perspective, how deep is this inflationary spiral we're in right now? 
I, I was talking to others, and you have experience uh, probably studying at the time of 79, 80, 81, 82, when Paul Volcker, the U.S. central bank chief, had to raise interest rates to 20 percent, and people were freaking out because of the inflation and then the stagflation that followed. We're not in that sort of phase right now. Is this a temporary phase because the supply chains are disrupted? And I know you have concerns about this falling disproportionately on Africa, disproportionately on the developing world. But how bad is the inflation cycle in your view? It's very interesting that you talk about uh, Paul Volcker because I was listening recently to a, a broadcast about uh, the challenge that he had at that time to have uh, this big hike in interest rate and uh, curb inflation. We had a time where I have two rewards to a little bit characterize what is happening. It's fragmentation. Fragmentation of capital market, fragmentation of supply chain, fra fra fragmentation of value chain, and uh, a low access to those. This is le leaving, leading to security. A term that we didn't hear uh, in the recent past was uh, security. Now we talk about energy security, security in your supply chain, secu security in a certain number of things, which has affected to the efficiency of markets. So these are the three elements for me that are interesting. But it comes at a time where I was 20-something uh, years ago, a Minister of Economy and Finance, and I don't envy the economy minister today, because at that time... It's you not had, like you have an easy job, though, which I, makes me laugh. <laughs> you just didn't want to be in the front line in the government. <laughs> exactly. But at that time, you had a certain type of shock, and you have the tools and instruments to address it. Today, you have multiple shock. You have supply shock and demand shock at the same time. So if you, if you tighten money supply, you'll find yourself high interest rate, and high interest rate affect disproportionately emerging economy because the risk bias is much higher in those countries. So what can we do and what needs to be done? Today, I think we have an opportunity to think collectively, and I think the World Government Summit is a good opportunity. In the past, you have grant money coming from DFIs, coming from philanthropy, going and supporting a particular group in, 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 in the society. Today, I think this is time of blending all this, because the risk level is so high today and the, uh, for, for developing countries that if you want to keep the flow of uh, cap capital flow, we need to de-risk to de-risk to de-risk. And for that, I think that we have a good conversation going, now, going on now between philanthropy, uh, uh, global aid. And I think to, to, to close, a good example is what happened at the COP26. While at the COP21, it was separate tracks. At the COP26, people said, if you want to change what is happening in the world, we need to de-risk and therefore to bring the money of philanthropy with the money of capital market mixed with the, 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 the aid. And I think that that's what will help us progressively going, coming out of it and keeping the flows that are needed to, uh, to, in, in, uh, in uh, emerging economies. Okay, what worries me the most, and I'll just ask a, a question because your role as managing director of the IFC, uh, I remember in my coverage at CNN, I was saying we're not going to get the vaccines to the developing world, the emerging markets, but in particular the least developed countries. That's exactly what played out. We still have vaccine penetration of 10, 12, 14, 15 percent. So this hoarding that was taking place. So there was a discussion with Larry Fink of BlackRock this morning about globalization being broken. Are uh, we not responding to the challenges quickly enough, though, Maktar? What do you think in terms of it's, I know what you're trying to do, but what's the reality of the cocooning or protectionism we see in the developed world? No, it's interesting. I just came back from Senegal, my home country, where an uh, mRNA plant will be, will be built by the end of this year, which is something that people didn't think about. And you'll be having a three mRNA vaccine plant in Africa in the, in the, by the end of the year. Uh, it was very interesting to see that today 50% of the world is vaccinated, only 11% in Africa, two-thirds in uh, Asia, and in this country, 100%. Mm. So you see that uh, it's, uh, it, uh, uh, it's, um, it, it varies a lot across countries. And we have seen that countries have been able to vaccinate their, their population, have been able to be more resilient. This country is another example of it. In the midst of the, of the crisis, everybody was converging here because it was a safe place to be, to be able to continue doing business. So there is a link uh, uh, on this. But there is a link to, to also, which is important, with the type of pandemics that we have in the future. Uh, avian flu, Ebola, all these are animal bone diseases which are affecting human beings. And if you not stop, if you don't act very strongly on climate change. Lastly, is that uh, uh, as we are doing that, there is an opportunity to leapfrog. And what will happen while we're having today, um, uh, uh, a we are worried about the movement of capital, 
uh, expertise in human capital is moving now uh, out of certain areas. And uh, I can uh, see in the future new poles of growth, particularly in, this, in the service industry, which will require emerging economy to invest much more in connectivity to be able to be part of the value, international value chain. So we have risk, but I think very important opportunities. And countries which are endowed with some resources like gas in, a, in, in developing country will be able to be part of the value chain for fertilizer, for production of urea, for uh, other type of, of needs which are currently constraints. Yeah, we've seen the, in your home country of Senegal, major natural gas deposits which are being developed, but mixed messages from the European Union telling them not to develop it. So I'm going to circle back because uh, the person next to you has seen, experienced a, a radical change in the last five years with the big discoveries in the Mediterranean, which has lowered your import bill. But I think, uh, Hala, I think, it, Your Excellency, it would be excellent to start uh, on the challenge that Egypt's faced with. It was fascinating to watch over the last week that you responded quickly with the reform package, quickly raising interest rates, engagement by the International Monetary Fund. Why was that so important to respond to the inflationary pressures and to say we're on it as a government? Well, let me tell you that timely corrective action is key. You need a timely corrective action because you can take the right actions, but delayed, so they don't have the right impact. So what we did during this crisis or these challenges and what we did even during the pandemic was timely corrective actions. We're a country with 103 million people, so uh, you need to act quickly. Uh, the pandemic had a major impact on the Egyptian economy. We still are recovering from the pandemic, and this recovery, as we generally, not only in Egypt, but even globally, we call it the unbalanced recovery, because when we started the recovery, you have an enhanced demand, but you don't have the enough supply. And that's what caused the disruption in the supply chain, and hence led to an increase in prices and the inflation that we're witnessing now. So what we have done during the pandemic is a balance, a balance between taking the right precautionary measures for our people, health measures, yet sustaining economic activity. This was a major strategy during the pandemic. We, the pandemic affected what is uh, interesting about the pandemic, it affected supply and demand. Some of the crisis or the financial crisis or the economic crisis, it affects supply or it affects demand. This pandemic affected the supply and demand at the same time. So we needed to act on both sides. So first, we enhanced public investment. We were lucky that we came out of an economic reform program that we started 2016 with the IMF. This program had fiscal and monetary uh, measures that helped make the economy uh, in a better position. Um, so we started enhancing public investment. We uh, also increased salaries. We had the fiscal space at that time uh, during the pandemic to enhance the supply side, to give uh, more salaries for people, increase salaries, give cash transfers to irregular workers. So all this helped us become one of the very few economies to achieve positive economic growth rate. And economic growth rate is necessary, but it is not enough. Because we needed, with the economic growth rate, we needed job opportunities. So unemployment also we had economic growth that was positive, we had very decent unemployment rate, and we had also reasonable inflation rate. And this is what we call economics, the triangle that is looking at the real economy, the real side of the economy. Good. Can that be maintained in your view, though? I mean, you're at uh, over 18 you know, pounds to the dollar. Yeah. You've raised interest rates, inflationary Absolutely. pressures are there. Uh, we shouldn't be panicking about Egypt. You, you feel like you have it stabilized? Uh, we are stable because, as I said, we took the right corrective measures, um, liberalizing the exchange rate to, in order to actually become really 
the effective exchange rate of the country in order to have the right trade balance for Egypt. Uh, we had also support from the IMF as a vote of confidence. We started our structural reform program a year ago. And the structural reform program is basically um, enhancing more the weight of the real economy. So we're focusing more on localizing industry. We're focusing more on agriculture and ICT with two cross-cutting pillars, which is greening the economy, and we are hosting the COP27, so greening the economy and looking into renewables, a desalination of water, green hydrogen, all this is very important uh, for us. And the other side and the other important pillar is the labor market, efficiency of the labor market. We, uh, as I said, we're at 103 million population, but we're also a very young population. So labor market for us is very important. So looking at the efficiency of the labor market, we started revamping the technical uh, uh, education uh, part, uh, technical side of our education. Uh, we started enhancing a number of schools, uh, applied schools, applied universities, increasing the number of technical and vocational uh, study and having the accreditation and the sector skills council. Because what was um, uh, negative or what was hindering the technical and the vocational part was the uh, mindset of the people on, and the social aspect of moving not to the uh, uh, conventional education but to the technical education. So uh, now linking the technical education and the applied schools with the industry uh, and having a very competitive uh, pay for these people, having accredited schools, uh, internationally accredited schools and internationally accredited universities is changing uh, the culture and changing the mindset. So these, we have been working on this um, structural reform program and I think this will make the economy more resilient and uh, more uh, uh, sustainable. Good, well, let's circle back afterwards on your rural development program as well, which you said yeah. was too informal in the past. Uh, Payush Goyal, it's great to have you and thanks for your patience in the first round of the questions here. I, I thought it was fascinating when I looked at the front end of the crisis in the pandemic looked like it was uh, catastrophic or cataclysmic for uh, India and then you stabilized the situation and responded to it. But you're suggesting now, even with this Russia-Ukraine crisis and the import bill for energy going up in India, that it should create an opportunity. It's almost like a wake-up call to accelerate the transition, but also to develop your own energy independence. Is that a true possibility or is that cheerleading on your behalf? No, undoubtedly, this is a story that has played out in India for years now. You spoke about the last 12 years. We went through a similar situation in 2008 to 10. We went through a crisis in terms of high energy prices around 12, 13, uh, 10 years ago, nine years ago. And therefore, ever since 2014, and at that point of time, if you recall, we were considered one of the fragile five economies. But ever since 2014, we've been focusing on structural reform. We've been focusing on strengthening processes, making it easier to do business, accumulating greater foreign currency reserves, stabilizing the economy in terms of more secular growth rather than the high ebbs and uh, tides that we used to see earlier. And our own experience is that the various programs over the last seven or eight years focused on the one hand towards a better life for the people of India, particularly the teeming masses who didn't have elementary uh, utilities like electricity, cooking gas, health care, drinking water. We've been focusing on the one hand through public investment on improving the lives of the people and on the other hand to ensuring our economic security, which includes energy security. You may be aware we have one of the world's fastest growing renewable energy I programs. Know, yeah. And we brought prices down through sheer scale and technology adoption to levels where today our clean energy is at lower cost than our fossil fuel based energy. And now we've reset the target almost so many times that we are losing track whether we have to do 450 gigawatt by 2030 or 500 gigawatt. And our prime minister is very demanding. He, he finds a way that there's something happening and he'll immediately up the ant on the story. So I can, I can tell you that we've been able to recognize the crisis well in time, convert that into an opportunity. 
And you spoke about uh, 2020 when COVID first hit the world. It was an animal nobody knew. Nobody knew what the protocols are, what the cure is, where the solutions are. And at that stage, I remember Prime Minister studying the Spanish flu and in fact getting some of us also to research that. And you'll be amazed at what we found. We found that those areas, uh, particularly in the United States, those states which focused on saving lives had a very rapid economic recovery. And those who focus only on saving their economy went downhill in the subsequent mm -hmm. decades. And therefore, in 20, we took the harsh decision to have a complete lockdown. We suffered enormously for about a quarter or thereabouts. And we had a slow path to recovery in the 2021 period. But in the long run, it's paying us rich dividends. It helped us focus ourselves on building better healthcare. Yes. It helped us focus on research so that we today have five or six domestic vaccines. It helped us to focus on energy independence, which is helping us in today's day and age, where we have our dependence on crude oil, but other than that, in terms of electricity, in terms of heating, cooling, all of that, we are completely uh, self-sufficient. And during the COVID period, when we announced our self-reliance package, and self-reliance was not a program to close our doors. It was actually a program to open our doors to international engagement and expand the frontiers of our uh, trade, both in goods and services, focus on attracting more investments. So all through the COVID period, we saw, for example, the highest ever foreign investments into India. During COVID, we've seen, and the current year closes on 31st March for us, we'll have the highest ever exports India has ever done in its history. It's 400 uh, 410 billion. billion. Of, yeah. It'll be upward of 410 billion. Yeah. We were 400 on the 21st of March. I saw that. We have 10 days more, so we'll be upward, maybe 415. Our service exports with no hospitality, no tourism, no travel, will be about 250 billion, the highest ever. Probably 20% more than the highest ever before this. So in every area, a very focused effort to keep the economy strong while at the same time taking public welfare, public good to the people. As she mentioned, we've also focused a lot on public investments. Our budget this year was largely about government-funded infrastructure projects on the back of which we see the multiplier effect mm. helping us uh, on the demand side. And obviously that leading to more investments to meet the supply constraints. We are working with partners like the UAE. And, you know, we had an engagement with UAE to get, up, get in place a comprehensive economic partnership. Start to finish, 88 days. Hmm. And not just an interim agreement, a comprehensive economic agreement is in the public domain, released only yesterday. And widely uh, encouraged, encouraging for all people, both in India and UAE, because it's truly fair, equitable, and balanced. So our effort is with those strategic partners who believe in a rules-based system, who believe in transparency, who believe in uh, equity in terms of engaging with us on trade. We are looking at expanding our relationship. We are looking at a two-way trade which helps India. We are looking at encouraging technology adoption in our country and taking it to the rest of the world. For example, yeah. we saw 40 yeah. startups in calendar 21, and we've already seen 30, 13 startups in the first two months of this year mm. becoming unicorns. Yes. So I'm seeing India and the youth of India really responding to these challenges with great enthusiasm and energy. Very good. Interesting. Okay, so we have 15 minutes left, so we have to keep very tight answers. I, everybody made a very good, bold uh, opening statement. I want to get to the heart of are we dividing the world because of Russia and Ukraine? Is there a risk here that uh, the UAE is neutral, Egypt's neutral, India's neutral on Russia and Ukraine? Probably a pretty good long-term or medium-term decision. But is the Iron Curtain coming back down again where we divide Europe and the United States uh, from the emerging market world. Is there a risk there of that transpiring? 
you straddle east and west, you have to be a global economy. But is this going to backfire because people are, are picking sides, trying to stay neutral, uh, don't want to show their hand too early in the game, but the U.S. is weaponizing the dollar on the sanctions on Russia. How do you see this playing out? Are we going back in time and putting up trade barriers, or can we stay engaged between the developed and developing world? I think uh, for the UAE's part, we learned a lot for the last, from the last decade, understanding crisis, understanding pandemics, and understanding issues. And when we look at <clears throat> the crisis globally, the geopolitics, there's, we can go back to history. And we understood from history as well when there are some sanctions or challenges that faces countries, where did the UAE play and how can we play in the future as well a bigger role in diplomacy and, 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 and really bring together people to work back to, 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 to the table. And I think that's something which is very vital. The most important so part... It's, it's, you're saying, Your Excellency, it's not wise to overreact. Is that what you're yes. suggesting? Um, well, that's what I'm suggesting, and what I'm suggesting as well, more deeply as well, is we need to create more trade routes. We need to create more opportunities and find opportunities to create more jobs. And I think that's something which is important uh, in the next. Uh, this, the area we are living in at the moment, the, uh, the UAE, the Middle East, uh, and I think we are living in, a, in an area where is the, the eye of the storm. There's a lot of challenges happening around us. There's a lot of you know, geopolitics issues, but we learned from that that we're very positive. We're very prosper. And we really look at creating more allies, creating more trade and more economies with, with the world. And I think that's something where we, we will stand and we will learn from. So the SEPA program that we, we signed with our, with, with our biggest allies, India, really going to bring trade routes together, going to bring really uh, a strong uh, uh, jobs creation between that. Uh, we're expecting uh, 250,000 jobs will be created uh, off of India off alone. The end alone. I think that's something oh. which is a huge as well for the next generations of youth, uh, for the people coming Coming in, that's something as well which is which is vital, and I think what we're looking at as well post post the pandemic and the issues and stuff is how can we actually go back to understand the trade routes, redesigning, re-engineering supply chains, and really focus on the bigger picture here, which is going to be the inflation part and 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 and, and the effect of oil prices going up, the challenge of that as well. So the UAE is part of the global economy. We're always going to be affected, not just the UAE, the whole world is going to be affected with such uh, sanctions, such, such economy. But what we really understand is we need to really play an active diplomacy and bring things back to, back to the table and actually work on more trades and, re, and, and redesign the supply chains. So give the context for those visiting from the outside. It's eight SEPA agreements for yes. 2022. That's fairly ambitious. Another one's supposed to be signed this week with Israel, so that's quite a milestone. And 27 overall. So. so the master plan goes 27, yes. 27. <laughs> Who came up with that crazy number? It wasn't you, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, what I wanted to focus on is something we brought up in our morning session and then midday with His Excellency Haldun Mubarak and Larry Fink. Mukhtar, from your standpoint from the IFC, because of the weaponizing of the dollar and sanctions, because of the willingness of China to start pricing goods, even pot potentially oil and gas in renminbi, is this the beginning of a transition to a much more diversified currency market where the dollar doesn't remain the kingpin, if you will? If you start pricing oil in renminbi and Russia takes payments in rubles in the future, is this the beginning of the fade? Is there a risk in that or is that a healthy uh, shift? As I said earlier, I'm just seeing fragmentation and it's interesting because I don't think that we can take the story of the, of the world and uh, use that model to analyze the situation. Today, what we just heard from the ministers is that you have uh, now, what they say in French, geography variable. You have a, a kind of a, a very uh, different constellation which are building. And I don't think you will have one monoblock here and another monoblock here. Depending on the issue, depending on the question, you have, you have some formation of blocks, of groups, of alliance, of trading groups, of trading partners around some issues. Let's take the issue of climate change. The, the views varies not around a particular line of, uh, of countries. You take an issue on, uh, on food security, you take an issue. Second, issue, second, second uh, situation is very different. The localization of liquidity and capital is very different from what it used to be in the past. It's much more distributed in the world. Uh, third, you, have, you will have more movement of human capital. And let's not forget that human capital is central in what you are thinking. I will not be surprised today to see a lot of uh, brain drain, not only uh, used to be from southern countries to, uh, to northern countries, to see brain drain from 
in, in the other direction because of the conditions. And all that, we create some ecosystems where we have more uh, unicorn, more, if you talk about technology, more uh, start uh, unicorn, more capital will be developing in different parts of the world. And that really means that you will really have now sub-regional and regional value chain which will be built, which will be more resilient than the one which was uh, more integrated recently. And that touch to the means of, uh, of payment, will it be in dollar or only or another currency? It will mean about the route, about the infrastructure. I was talking to, to some leaders in Central Asia with the current situation. They will have to think about it, totally different logistics, totally different route to be able to export their goods. That will have implication in the way some part of the world be developed. So what, I'm, what I'm, I want to say by that in, in two words is that we will be having a multipolar Contrary to what we can think initially, I think we'll have multiple constellation, a multipolar, multipolar source of growth that will make it, in a sense, if we well manage, uh, increase the resilience of the world economy. Okay. I think we should spend a moment here on COP27, COP28. The host of COP27 is Egypt, 28 is uh, Abu Dhabi. And one of the, and this also affects India as well, one of the things that's been left out of the COP26 debate is we still have 750 million people without access to electricity, about 600 million of them on the African continent. Which role are you going to have to strike the right balance, Hala, about, yes, we pursue aggressively the transition, but let's not forget access to electricity at the same time. And I know I was with Minister Amola at uh, Egypt Petroleum at the time, yeah. and he said we have to make access part of the conversation and accelerate that in the 21st century of people living without electricity seems almost uh, shocking. Absolutely. What influence are you going to have there? Definitely. Always having the balance is the right approach. So, uh, Just yes. watch your time here because we only have eight minutes. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> Thank you. And, and this gets me to a very important point that I was talking to you about uh, uh, a few minutes ago during the uh, recess uh, uh, before starting the session, that one of the very important things that Egypt have embarked on and um, we have to realize that we have passed through a period where we had unpolitical stability between 2011 and 2014. These were four years of total political instability. We had absolutely negative growth rates during this time until His Excellency the President came to power. So starting that time and with the economic reforms, we invested a lot in infrastructure. And at that time in 2014, we, had, we suffered from electricity cuts for about half a day, it affected our lives at home, it affected uh, uh, our uh, factories, it affected hospitals, it affected almost the lives of all the Egyptian people. So we invested a lot in infrastructure. We spent almost about 400 billion US dollars during the past seven years in investing in infrastructure. And comes to this also is investing in the rural areas of Egypt. So we also started an initiative called Decent Life Initiative, whereby we are upgrading and enhancing the quality of life of 4,500 villages across Egypt around, uh, um, around almost three to four years. This is basically 58 million population. We're providing them with sanitation, with clean water, with electricity, with the roads, with job opportunities, with green projects, and it's all sustainable cities. Here comes, so we're doing sustainable mm. cities. We're providing them with decent housing. So this is one of the ma major projects that we are doing in order to uh, uh, enhance the quality of life of people. Coming to the uh, COP, we are embarking on a lot of green projects. Uh, uh, we are at the area of the Suez Economic uh, uh, Canal uh, Zone. We have about uh, a number of green hydrogen projects that we are uh, uh, witnessing, it's starting as a pilot project these days. Uh, we have also um, established the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Egypt. That's, that's a major vehicle whereby it is uh, crowding in private sector. It's, a, it's, a, it's an investment arm of the government, but its main role is to crowd in private sector, not to crowd out private to sector. To encourage them to come in. To cr so we're, we're moving, we are finding uh, investment opportunities. We are transferring investment uh, 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 opportunities, putting them to become investment products, and we're offering this to investors, whether local or uh, foreign. We have four sub funds. One of them is the Green Fund that we are establishing now. 
Uh, the other is a fintech fund. The third is a utilities. And the fourth is a medical and pharmaceutical. Interesting. Uh, Payush Goh, I think it would be interesting to hear with such a large economy uh, and the progression you've made in terms of diversification. Uh, I don't hear any alarm in this panel. So if I sit in the World Government Summit in 2023, I don't want anybody saying, well, you were chairing an emerging market panel and nobody talked about the risk that are inherent today. We can sail through this most turbulent time with a war underway, coming out of a pandemic with inflation and not have a global shock. I think we can because world economies are much more resilient. I believe that uh, partnerships have been created which are supporting each other. Technology is playing a very important role in changing people's lives and bringing down costs. So while we have inflation on the one hand in certain products, technology is helping us to mitigate that problem in other areas. So my own sense is if I look at my own country, for example, the electricity question, by 2019, in a span of four years, we had managed to take electricity to every village. And we have about 600,000 villages in India and taken it to every home so that today nobody can say if he wants an electricity connection, he won't get it. Similarly, I personally believe that the food gain production that India has grown over the last few years is not only enough to feed every Indian, but today we are providing large amounts of agricultural products to other parts of the world. Our agri-exports is about $50 billion wow. uh, this year end, and next year we'll, of course, increase it. Uh. All through the COVID, we were ensuring our friendly partners got adequate uh, foodstuffs. Huh. Uh, we, we are happy to support Egypt in its requirements of wheat uh, because of the conflict. And we can make sure that not a single home in Egypt will have a problem of wheat all through the next year or two years or three years. Wow. Or why not forever? Yeah, forever? So we are, I think, in a sweet spot where emerging markets have strengthened themselves over the last few years. They will certainly need to be supported if we have to meet the climate goals. We have yet to see the uh, developed world come up with truly uh, practical funding programs. We've not seen the $100 billion I know. any year for the last, I what, it's, it was to start 10 years ago. We haven't seen a single dollar out of that. Whenever we talk about climate finance, that throw us to the companies like, uh, you know, all the funds and say, go and meet Merrill Lynch or Goldman Sachs. I can do that on my own. I don't need anybody to introduce them to me. So I think there's a lot of disparity in terms of intention and action in terms of climate. But on the overall, I think responsible governments will tide over very well. Irresponsible governments truly will have to worry. Okay, excellent. Uh, final word to our host today. Uh, Hala talked about COP27, uh, and we know the challenge is going to COP28. Everybody was almost chuckling from the outside when the, uh, the nuclear facility at Baraka was built, and nobody laughs anymore because there's 25% of the grid supplies, right, coming from Baraka. The Aldafra solar uh, farm is one of the biggest in the world. But what is the calibration? We heard from Dr. Sultan al Jabra of Adnoc, uh, who's going to be very involved in COP28, saying, we can't switch off the hydrocarbon investment until we make the transition uh, to renewables. So how do you see the role of complementing COP27 and the role of COP28 and what it means for the economy in this diversification transition period, would you say? Climate change is a, a very systematic risk that we, we understand. And the, the follow-up on COP27, 28, and 29 and moving forward really shows us the importance of the such risk that we need to address heads on. It's a, it's a very important risk, and I think it's important to understand that the climate change by itself, you know, uh, according to the uh, uh, Swiss RE Institute, is going to wipe out 18% of the global GDP by 2050. Now, that is a huge risk for the economy, and that's something we, could, we should just sit, sit here and actually just you know, take it in. And I think that's something which is very important to identify. 
uh, and come in as a, as a platform like this today and really speak about it and really address uh, such risk about what opportunities can be created. I think the green growth strategies that we have in place, the circular economy uh, policies that we set, uh, I think that's something of a transition that will take us as well into the future of investments, uh, into these such new technologies. Baraka coming into power uh, uh, at 25%, I think that's something as well which is very vital and important for the UAE to diversify its energy uh, mix for the next decade or so, but I think this is something which is important. We heard Khaldun mentioning the investment into solar power earlier today, where it was about, what, 32 or 33 cents a kilowatt. Today, there is about 1.25 cents a kilowatt. That shows you the technology is advancing as well in the future, which is important to diversify into renewable energy. I think COP28 and COP29, this dialogue of really addressing this climate change risk in a, in a systematic way, where we need to really understand and that transition and, and, and push it forward is something which is important. But nevertheless, this challenge as well will create a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of job creation going to come out of it for the economy into circularity, into green growth, and this is something we need to capitalize on. Good. Uh, Bakhtar, we have uh, less than a minute because we went through the time, but I think it's only right to have an international institution say, are we rising to the challenge? We have uh, daughters that are 16 and 19. If you talk to any child between 10 and 18, they think the, the world's going to fall apart in 20 years, yeah. that they're not going to have the lifestyle that we did in the baby boom. <laughs> My daughter thinks the same. Yeah, this is the point. So are we resp responding fast enough? How do we get the alarm out of the next generation so they don't point the finger at us and say, you didn't do enough? is the question. What do you think from your position? We're responding, but not fast enough. Uh, it's like uh, someone who has a lot of potential and not use it as, uh, as a full potential. I, I see the world a little bit as a, a runner who can run a sprinter in, uh, in 9.5 seconds and running at still at 11 seconds. Mm. So I think that uh, what has a bottleneck? We are doing very interesting things. For instance, we are working with, uh, with India on, on battery storage, which will be an important yes, part of the, of, of the, and I see the cost going down and it will go down. We're working with Egypt on solar, on solar energy. It's one of the largest one. We're working with Dubai on, uh, on cooling. Uh, district cooling is very important. We are not talking enough about it, but the impact on things we are investing in a company in, in, in Dubai. But I think that we have two things that we can do together. We can uh, go out of these crisis by being more efficient, the waste in food production are huge. The waste in energy are huge. I just came from the World Water Forum. The, the waste in water are important. So continue working on efficiency. We save the planet, but at the same time, help us move out of the crisis much faster. So we have a, a, an opportunity. The second one is uh, technology uh, is, is available, is abundant. Accelerate the path of uh, technology adoption uh, 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 would be an essential part of doing that. The third one is to bring the youth in defining the solutions. We should not uh, uh, do the mistake of the past, thinking that uh, leaders uh, can do it without hearing what the youth is doing. And I think there are different fora now where more and more this dialogue is happening and ideas coming from startups, from the youth, are adopted by, by, by leaders and policymakers to make the change we're talking about. Great. I uh, was wondering how it worked having four summits under one umbrella on day zero, as we're calling it at World Government <laughs> Summit today. But I, A, I personally have to thank you for the in invite to Investopia. Uh, but this went off extremely well, uh, having all these, it's almost like a train station with different tracks and different trains coming in and out. Uh, but congratulations for pulling Investopia off and to you and your team. Uh, let's give a nice round of applause to all our panelists for playing along for the full hour and very directly.